Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Let's pause our series narrative to explore a complicated but fascinating concept that permeates the ether of our modern North American societal discourse. Historical guilt is the feeling of great shame, regret, and or sadness for a historical moment, event, period, or something that happened in the past. In other words, the outpouring of sympathy for bygone transgressions that most times don't have anything to do with current generations. Take, for example, the idea that modern Christians are pressured into feeling sorrow or guilt for the Holy Crusades in the Middle Ages. Germans, born after World War II, made to feel guilty for the Holocaust. Or, non-Amerindians in North America, assuming culpability for the past treatment of native indigenous peoples. Our present social environment and dissemination of academic and popular history raises profound questions. Are people destined to see themselves as the descendants of victims or oppressors? Is it possible to be freed from responsibility for the past, even after a long time has gone by? What's the half-life of historical guilt? How is it that young people come to feel guilty about the sins of their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents? How do certain groups of modern North Americans internalize guilt about perceived past transgressions, maybe even coming to resent the assumption that they're supposed to feel guilty at all? How do atrocious ethnic crimes become disembodied ideas, morphing into a vague sense of moral responsibility? Is there a solution to this cycle of self-condemnation and historical defiance? Is guilt among certain white North Americans about slavery and racism counterproductive posturing, virtue signaling, and inauthentic self-contortions that hurt more than they help? Do these emotions reconfirm the differences between people of different ethnic backgrounds rather than carving out common ground? Bottom line, is historical guilt a good, bad, positive or negative concept. The prevalent mode of thinking in North America is dominated by a specific, narrow, popular culture and media viewpoint that is rarely challenged. Allow me to introduce an alternative thinker regarding the interpretation of historical guilt. Jordan Peterson is an internationally influential Canadian clinical psychologist, media personality, author, and psychology professor who began to receive widespread attention as a public intellectual in the late 2010s for his views on cultural and political issues. Here are a few excerpts from his podcast referring to this controversial topic, with references to his book, Maps of Meaning. I think we see historical guilt everywhere in the world now, that guilt in the West, in the United States, in Canada, and lesser than what the German people felt after World War II. But there are accusations of colonialism and white supremacy and guilt over the terrors of history that brought all of us to where we are now. And I think that it's something that we all face in some sense as an existential problem. I mean, there are permanent existential problems death, suffering, deceit, sin, and all of the catastrophes of history that, for better or worse, put us where we are now. And the issue of how each of us bear guilt and responsibility for things that were done by the culture that we're part of, say, or by our immediate ancestors, or even by our distant ancestors, that's a very difficult psychological question, because we're historical creatures. The existential psychologists following Heidegger, I believe, talked about that problem as the issue of throneness. Throne, as in T-H-R-O-W-N. You're thrown into the world, all of us, and you're thrown into your culture arbitrarily. You're thrown into your family arbitrarily. You're thrown into your body arbitrarily. And we all have to deal with that. And figuring out how to do that individually is very difficult. I mean, what I was trying to do in Maps of Meaning was to bring this down to, in my other books for that matter, was to bring this problem down to the individual level. Because each of us, in some sense, have the capacity to do all the terrible things that anyone has ever done. And you see that manifest itself en masse very frequently. And that happened in the Soviet Union. It happened in Germany. It happened everywhere, really. 
if you just have to look hard enough and long enough in some ways. So the question is, what do you do about that guilt that's part and parcel of being a member of any culture that has done things that are reprehensible in the past? And the answer to that is try to understand it and try not to do it in the future. We all do have that guilt and we all do have that responsibility. It, it's very difficult for that not to become overwhelming if you look into it deeply. And you have to look into it deeply to some degree to scare yourself badly enough into putting your life together so that maybe the probability of such things will be less in the future. But it's a very tricky thing to manage. So I think maybe partly what you do is you regard it, and, and this is what the existential psychologists were pointing to, it's part of the nature of being human to bear that historical guilt. It's impersonal in some sense. You still have to take it seriously and you still have to do something about it, but there's an impersonal and universal element to it and, and that makes it somewhat easier to bear. Some of that guilt, that can be extremely corrosive. One of the things that I was extremely affected by when I went on my tour, I was offering people words of encouragement and it seemed that the people who are benefiting most from that in some sense were young men. And I think maybe that's because they have been formally criticized so much in the last 30 or 40 years. So they had the deepest hunger. And I saw how much hunger, how much thirst there was for words of encouragement in the face of that accusation and guilt. We all stagger forward under our burden of sin. That's the archaic language. And modern people, while well, they don't really understand what that means, and yet they're discouraged and guilty about the conditions of their own existence. And that's the same thing. And so then, because I was offering words of encouragement, because I would rather that people did well than do badly, it was stunning how much impact that had on people and how grateful they were for it in the face of that accusation and guilt. That masculine ambition was fundamentally malevolent. And, you know, fair enough, there's a real ethical conflict there. Europeans did come to North America and South America, and 95% of the indigenous people died from plague, you know, measles, mumps, smallpox. And so that was an absolute catastrophe. And then well, the relationships between the Europeans who have come to the Western Hemisphere and the indigenous people have been fraught with conflict, to say the least, and no one's exactly sure how to rectify that. But any sign of masculine ambition, let's say, as fundamentally immoral because of its association with colonial domination and technological nightmare and the despoiling of the planet and all of that struck to the heart. And so we bear this terrible guilt, all of us. And it interferes with our rise, with our ability to rise up. And all of that has to be sorted out. We have to distinguish between valid ethical striving to make the world a better place and immoral ambition. And we have to be very careful that we don't look at those who have put themselves together perhaps better than we have and have been successful because of it and warp our morality because we want to tear them down because as examples that we fall short of. It's very easy for this sort of thing to become warped by resentment and hatred. I think I saw an example of that in the United States. Political twisting. It puts itself forward as an ethical statement that's aimed at the betterment of the lives of the poor, but lurking underneath that is a hatred for those who have been successful and an insistence that anyone successful has only become successful because they've exploited and hurt others. And sometimes that's the case in some situations probably for all of us, but sometimes and always are very different. I've studied deeply the consequences of that attitude going too far. Perfect example of that in the Soviet Union. Kill all the successful farmers because all they did was exploit, despite the fact that all those people were serfs like 50 years previously. Kill them all. Take what they earned. What happens? Six million people die. There's no doubt that economic exploitation occurs. There's no doubt that not all material wealth is gained in an ethical manner. That's why those discussions about oppression and exploitation always continue. There's always some truth in it. We see historical guilt everywhere in the world now. For example, there's this trope in, this is particularly the case in the United States, that all white people are racist. And that goes along with this claim that American society in particular, but not only America, European society in general, and that would include Russian society, are in some deep sense white supremacist. 
And those accusations are variations of political thinking emerging from this sense of universal guilt. The answer to the question, are all white people racist, is yes, but it's also no. And here's why. Are all people racist? Well, yes, all of us. And why would I say that? Well, the anthropological literature is quite clear on this, as far as I understand it, that virtually every society that's ever been discovered, especially when they're isolated, tends to refer to their own group members basically as human beings and all those outside of that group as some other category. And I think that's a reflection of our in-group preference and our ability to cooperate and form bonds. So it's not trivial, and it's difficult for all of us to immediately extend that sense of kin, and that's the root word for kindness, extend that sense of kin beyond our in-group. And it's also extremely difficult because, well, how many people can you actually attend to and care for? You're limited in your scope. And so the answer to the question, are all white people racist, is yes, but it's still a bad question because the inclusion of the word white implies that it's unique to, say, white people. And that's just not the case. It's true of human beings. It's probably true of our closest biological relatives in a profound and meaningful sense. Chimpanzees go to war. That was discovered by Jane Goodall in the 1970s. It was a great shock. They go on raiding parties. And if they outnumber if small troops of generally juvenile males go on raiding parties near the border of their territory. And if they find a chimp from another territory and they outnumber them, they'll tear them to pieces. And so this is a deep problem. It's a problem for all of us because it's actually tangled up inside our goodness. That's also what makes it so difficult because the fact that I really love my family members, let's say, and then my community around that, that in some sense is also why I'm not so positively predisposed to anything I see outside of that that I think might disrupt it. And so we have to have some sympathy for that proclivity. And we need to understand what we do about it now in the modern world where it's doing more harm than good because maybe we don't need to be parochial in that sense like we were in the past. And perhaps we can't afford to be because we're so technologically powerful now that that tendency to demonize the outgroup member, that'll destroy all of us if we don't figure out how to get it under control. And so I felt that the reason I wrote Maps of Meaning essentially was to figure out how you get that under control as an individual. And that took me deep into morality, I would say. And the answer to the question of that problem is that we have to become better people. We have to become more conscious. We have to become more conscious of our ethical obligations. We have to become more conscious of the nature of good and evil, to put it bluntly. And we have to bear the responsibility, the ethical responsibility that our powerful technology demands. That's also something I learned, I would say, most explicitly from Carl Jung. He made the case, it's a very interesting argument, that he believed that the scientific endeavor emerged out of the alchemical endeavor. And he has his reasons for believing that. And I think it's a reasonable proposition historically. There's many roots of the scientific endeavor, but Newton was an alchemist. So there's one staggeringly important example. And alchemy was a fantasy about the value that might be lurking in the material world. And Jung believed that we needed to fantasize about what value might be held in study of the material world for thousands of years before we could organize ourselves psychologically to do something as technically sophisticated as science. But alchemy was still one-tenth science and 90% imagination and religion in some sense. And then the, the scientific part of it blew up massively over the last 400 years, and it's put us where we are technologically. But the ethical part didn't blow up and expand in the same way. But it has to. We have to be as ethical as we are powerful, or we won't manage, and we'll destroy ourselves. And maybe we'll do it because we want to. So we have to grow up in some sense. And that means we have to become conscious of things that we have not yet become conscious of. And I think that means becoming more conscious of what it means that there are religious values, what that means ontologically, so what that means for the nature of being itself, and what it means in terms of how each of us perceive and act, and what our obligations are, and what the costs are of not doing that. We have to become very serious about such things in a way that we are not serious yet. Next time, we return to our series narrative and continue the saga of 16th century Protestant settlements in the territory of Florida. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.